Okay, so let's bring something up. Okay, these are all PDFs. So you're probably gonna have to run it from up, upstairs. Okay. Go. Where'd it go? Hang on, what happened here? Meeting presentations. Okay, something just wonky happened. So here, let me see if it looks the same. Public help. Oh, there we go. That's what the problem is. Okay, so I'm just gonna bring up the uh, the first one. Okay. Okay, so. I mean, if that's just a, is that a PDF? They're all PDFs. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't really need that. No, but somebody has to, somebody has to drive. Okay, would that be from here or there? You can do it upstairs. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, the clicker doesn't work. So yeah, you can drive from up, uh, up at our other one. So. Since I'm not doing all this part, I'll be the driver for this one. <laughs> okay, now the thing is, is you gotta remember this. Okay. Don't X out, back out. Back out. Okay, if you X out, you get out of the OneDrive. Okay. Okay, so let's go up top and let's let's uh, teach you how to. As long as I know the rat and how it works. Hot. Click it. Testing one, two. It sounds well. Good to go there. Um, and yeah, same thing with this. I think I'm going with it. I'll keep it up here just in case. Yeah, I'll keep it around just in case. I'm thinking about it. There's like some stuff. And like, y'all have mics up there. Maybe you want to keep it. Cool, cool. I think I think we're going to do it. Yeah, we can drive the distance. There, okay. which I can help out with. And oh, yeah, for sure. I'll help you. I'll go right now, but don't keep that. Don't get it. <laughs>
Gray button, turn green on. Are we needing these or uh, do we need to tell? Not not this one, but these to bleed them out in case. Okay. Yeah, something happens and Emily's gonna run. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Is this on? Good morning, everyone. I'm gonna call this meeting of the Board of Health, El Paso County Board of Health to order. And I'll start off with, a, with our members roll call. To my left, Vice President Doris Ralston. 
Uh, Commissioner Cami Bremer is going to be on her way. Uh, she had an early morning meeting, so she'll be joining us in a few moments, hopefully. Commissioner Lojinos Gonzalez. Uh, here, thank you. Council Member Dave Donaldson. Here, Merry Christmas. And uh, General Jack Briggs unfortunately had a uh, conflict this morning, is not able to be with us today, so uh, that's he's excused in his absence. We have Mayor Glant Havenyar, Dr. Deborah Chan, and Dr. Richard Vu had a uh, family emergency come up and is unable to be with us this morning as well. And my name is Ted Colas, and the rest of us are present. Hopefully everyone's had an opportunity to look over the agenda. I need a motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Moved uh, by Doris and then second by uh, Mayor Havenyar. All in favor of approval of the agenda, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Thank you. And now uh, we move on to Board of Health comments. And I'll start to my far left with Commissioner Gonzalez. Any comments? I just wanted to wish everybody a very Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Right. And uh, Councilman Donaldson. Uh, no comments. Okay, Doris. And Grant Glant. No comments. And Dr. Chen. Okay. All right. I'm going to uh, ask Susan. I think we've got a couple of new staff members that Susan would like to introduce to us. Good morning, everyone. I would like um, a couple of, of our new um, team members to to come up. One is uh, Lee Perry. She is our new business operations director for public health, and I'd like to. Um, introduce herself, say a few words, um, noting that we previously had a, an administrative manager position, that that position was eliminated, and um, we've needed a business operations director, and um, Lee is fulfilling that role, and this um, is funded also through the uh, um, CDC supplemental funding, as well as the uh, um, CDC infrastructure grant. So welcome, Lee. Good morning. So my name is Lee Perry and I'm the new director of business operations with El Paso County Public Health. I have been working in healthcare in Colorado since 2006. My background is project management, business management, and I have been focused in the clinics and in the hospital systems with both UC Health and Centura, now Common Spirit. And so I am very excited to be here and working with the team and looking forward to the projects coming up and getting to know you all better. Welcome. Thank you, Lee. And next, Sarah Kinney, if you could come up, please. Um, <laughs> Lee's la uh, first day was last week, Monday. Sarah's first day was a couple of days ago, Monday. And Sarah is um, new with us, and she will be serving in the role of budget supervisor and full-time for um, El Paso County Public Health. And you all are familiar with Sam um, Montany, um, but at some, some point I, I do anticipate a, a transition. And um, Sarah, if you would like to say a few, few words about yourself and introduce yourself, please. Good morning. Um, I'm very delighted to be transitioning from supporting as financial analyst for El Paso County um, digital strategy and technology to supporting um, public health. Um, I am an Air Force Academy graduate with a background in management. Um, after my service as a pilot in the Air Force, I founded my own um, defense technology firm where I supported healthcare companies and defense contract firms in using data and um, software to develop uh, strategies for serving our nation's most important healthcare and defense missions, notably earning the first sole source contract from Space Force after its formation. Um, my company was sold in 2018, and so I've transitioned into serving in other public sector positions like working with El Paso County. So I'm pleased to um, use my skills in technology um, and data-driven um, analysis to support these important missions. I do also have a background in grants, 
um, in research and working with um, MIT and John Hopkins. So I'm excited to support the diverse revenue streams you have here at the county um, and the complexity of the missions that you support. So thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Sarah. Welcome. I also wanted to to mention that you know as we um, you're fine. You can go sit down. Um, we we are. Um, going to continue evaluating fees across the agency, um, just as we did with environmental um, health services. We are looking at um, various funding streams um, to see where we can um, increase and in a minimum maintain the funding that we have. And so with the efforts that are going on with the um, state uh, legislature and um, the opportunity to um, maintain um, funding and increase funding, the these new team members will be uh, crucial to helping us to maintain our funding and also increasing the funding as we um, continue to look towards the the future. And I will say that um, the Joint Budget, Budget Committee met, um, I think it was on Monday in the afternoon, and there was um, a bill that, that was heard, um, Senate Bill uh, 243, which has provided uh, funding to from the state to um, our agency and state per capita dollars. And I understand that it was very positive that the Joint Budget Committee has opened the door for public health to present the case to um, maintain the funding and also potentially increase that funding. And so um, again, these team members will be um, very helpful in, in how we um, advocate for, for maintaining and increasing funding at the state level and, and through different funding revenue streams. So welcome Lee and welcome Sarah. We are so excited to to have you. Great, thank you. It's always exciting to see uh, these, what we think are critical positions being being filled for us. Uh, we're moving on to the approval of minutes. Hopefully everybody had an opportunity to look over the minutes and I'll need a uh, motion and second for that. Okay, Dr. Chan made the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, that was a tie. So I'm gonna give that to the mayor over there uh, for our second. All in favor of approval of the minutes as written, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, moving on. Do we have any public comment? Not aware of any public comment of anyone that is not on the agenda and I'm getting the, the negative shake from uh, our staff out there. So no public comment. We'll move on to finance and budget then. Good morning, Samantha Montmany, Budget Supervisor for Health and Human Services with El Paso County. Um, before you guys in your packet, you have the November um, financial information. Um, at this time, we are showing about slightly um, under our anticipated revenues. Again, a lot of that is from those 100% reimbursable COVID style grants that we just didn't have the expenditures, so we weren't able to draw down from. Um, as well, and on the expenditure side, we're also seeing that underspender, underspending with personnel and operating. Again, we are really keeping our eye on it. We're getting really close to the end of the year, so um, to see how it all lands out. Do you guys have any questions for me on this? Questions for any board members? No, I don't think so on that. Thank you, Sam. Okay, uh, we're going to need a motion and a second to accept the budget that Sam just presented. Uh, so moved, City Councilman Donaldson. Thank you, and a second. Thank you, Mayor Mayor Havenier. All in favor of approval of these uh, of the. Uh, Finances is just presented. Let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Okay. Now, do you have more to do? All right, are we gonna do the contracts now then? Okay, 
We have some previously approved contracts. Let's start with the reproductive health. Oh, sorry, see what I did? Do you want to do the other one? Okay. There is supposed to be a PowerPoint here. Um, all right. Well, we'll just, I've got some notes, so we'll move on without it. Um, unless I, would you like me to wait? Okay. All right. Good morning. My name is Summer South. I am the Reproductive Health Clinic uh, Program Manager. Um, and it looks like we're headed in the direction of having slides available. So we'll wait just a moment. There we are, kind of, sort of. <laughs> All right. So um, what I have before you today is just a renewal of our STI grant. Um, but before I jumped into that, I did want to highlight the fact that yesterday uh, we started our work at the CJC, uh, Screening and Treating uh, Women of Reproductive Age uh, at the CJC. And um, so I not only wanted to highlight that because we're really excited to continue that work, but I also wanted to thank all of you um, because in part, you guys are what made uh, this possible for us to do this work with this unique client population. So thank you. We're really excited to continue the progress there. Um, back to the renewal, uh, the grant funding, this is intended to uh, reduce cases of uh, STIs, reduce cases of infertility uh, and pregnancy complications associated with STIs, and to provide education on prevention, risk reduction, and treatment of STIs. Um, I also wanted to highlight the fact that uh, this is supplemental funding to the work that we do, so it is not a standalone grant uh, expected to support everything. Um, our grant funding uh, for the next 13 months will be 53,566. Um, you'll notice that is, this is a 13-month contract, which is a change from previous years. This is due to CDC funding timeframe changes. Um, so this grant will go all the way through January of next year uh, and then start February and then it will be back to a 12 month uh, contract there on out. So, all right, next slide, please. All right, so the impact. Um, we want to continue to foster community engagement um, and continue to demonstrate clinical excellence uh, with the dollars that we receive in this contract. Uh, we do that through reducing barriers to reproductive health care. Um, we, uh, we do that through reduced to no cost visits for those who financially qualify, uh, doing things like accepting walk-ins and same day appointments, which don't often happen in uh, regular clinics in our community. Um, and then having an internal uh, and external robust referral system for continuity of care for our patients. Um, we conduct outreach, uh, we do tabling at events, promoting services, not only in our clinic, but also um, for all of El Paso County Public Health, uh, letting people know that we're here for them. Um, and another thing that we did this past year was the um, implementation um, of a Women's Health Day at Springs Rescue Mission. That was a big success. We were a big part of the planning process, and then we also provided services and brought in other community partners. Um, which is a huge goal of ours. So that that speaks to our outreach. Um, we do provider education within the community. Um, and uh, let's see here. And then participation in the Colorado Congenital Syphilis Review Board. Uh, as far as demonstrating clinical excellence, uh, we provide the community with subject matter experts in diseases such as syphilis and MPOX. Um, we do that through continuing education, live virtual events, you know, things like that. Um, we uh, ensure adherence to the CDC recommended treatment guidelines. Um, that is demonstrated through internal chart audits, which we are always passing a 100% and I'm very proud of. Um, and then the coordination of referrals and services. I spoke to that a little bit before. We do have a robust um, internal and external referral system within the community, getting uh, our clients the care that they need outside of just reproductive health care and what we're able to provide. Um, and then one of the big things, addressing congenital syphilis. So we do that through uh, our review board uh, participation. Um, 
our syphilis referral system with many community providers, um, and then again, the execution of our new grant at the CJC, testing women of reproductive age, and hopefully uh, working towards getting those rates to come down. And that is it. Do I have any questions? Councilman Donald. Yeah, thanks, Mr. President, and uh, thank you, Summer. You know, you mentioned the Women's Health Day at Springs Rescue Mission. Is that, I got a feeling that it's annually, but is it is it monthly or annually or how often? Um, right, so last year was the first time. It is a project that was spearheaded by CU Anschutz medical students uh, for a community outreach project they were doing. Um, we were reached out to, and so that was actually the first one. Um, this coming year, we have plans to make it biannual and then eventually, hopefully, quarterly. Okay, good. Uh, and then there's some statistics here in, in the synopsis on this about um, you know, almost 1,200 chlamydia tests, about the same for gonorrhea, 614 syphilis tests. Do you know what the just in general, roughly, the percentages are, and is it, hey, that's way above, uh, you know, average for the county, or do you have any data like that? Uh, I know it's not that kind of a presentation, but sure. it'd be interesting if you if you know it off the top of your head. Um, so, when looking at the numbers that you're referring to, those are how many tests we administered. Those aren't necessarily positives. Understood. That's okay. what I was asking. Okay. Yeah. Um, but we can get that information to you. I don't have it on hand here uh -huh. to give to you, but we do have that information. In general, is it uh, the case that, hey, we get a lot, our positive rate is higher than average or typical sure. for El Paso County? Yes. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, so right now for chlamydia and gonorrhea, I think we sit at number five uh, in all the counties in Colorado. So we're top five. The county is. County. Yes. El but Paso County. Mm -hmm. I'm obviously not good at asking questions. The tests that we do through public health, sure. do we get a big chunk of those uh, positives for the county or is it, no, we, we actually are the same as uh, hospitals and, and family practice clinics. Ah, uh, understood. Getting at? I apologize. I oh, didn't understand fine. the question. Um, you know, I don't have that information, but I can get that to you. Okay. And then my only other question, you said yesterday was the uh, first day at the Criminal Justice Center. Were, were you down there for yeah, that? I was. And we did some testing? Yes, we did. Former PA, I have to ask, were there any positives yesterday? <laughs> um, as of right now, no. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation, Summer. Um, the question I have um, is whether um, demographic data is collected, particularly um, in relation to not only race, but um, uh, socioeconomic status, um, and also whether information is collected on the tests that are conducted that are positive, whether those are uh, repeat positives on the same individuals, or is that information um, not identifiable identify to personal information? Um, great questions. Uh, to answer your first question, yes, we do collect all demographic data. Um, part of our deliverable for this grant is a monthly STI report to CDPHE. Um, in which they ask all of those questions. We have it in template format, um, and we do a monthly report as well as an end-of-year cumulative report, which I am working on um, currently and can get that information to you, the demographic breakdown. Um, and then as far as duplicated and non-duplicated reports for positives, yes, we can differentiate between the two of those, and we do have that information. I don't have them, obviously, on hand, but uh, can get that information to you. And then I have one follow-on question. Yes. Um, the population that's being tested, um, is it a stable enough population where um, they are able to be retested at say three months for reinfection rates? Yes, so that's a fantastic question. That is something within the clinic that um, we are working really hard towards ensuring that there is that follow-up. So one way in which we manage that. So to answer your question about the population, um, it is a difficult population for follow-up. 
there is no question about that. That being said, the systems that we have in place uh, are twofold. One, we work with disease intervention specialists that are uh, through CDPHE. Um, in which we share information about patients and we track them back and forth. We have a robust referral system with them. In addition to, um, especially our syphilis tracking, which those are often the ones that require multiple treatments and the follow-up testing. Um, and so we work closely with them to make sure that those clients out in the community are being reached and then even services available, not on our end, but on their end. Um, to come to the clinic and ensure follow-up treatment, even if they move to another county, sharing that information with them, because it is quite a transient population that we deal with. Um, and then, I'm sorry, what was the second question? That that also answers That encompasses, the second okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay, any other questions or comments from the board? Okay, I'm looking for a motion to accept this grant. I'll move to accept the grant. Second. And thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez, for the second. All in favor, aye. pardon me, all in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Merry Christmas. Hey, Carolyn. Hello and good morning. Carolyn Gary, Development Officer for El Paso County Public Health. Um, I am here today uh, with a grant from the CDC. This is the A2 Foundational Capabilities Grant. This is part of the existing grant that we have through the CDC for the Public Health Infrastructure Grant, otherwise known as our, our FIG funding. That funding comes in two components. A1 is the five-year funding. Um, and A2 is annual funding, and so it's really dependent upon funds available at the federal level. For this year, for 2024, we were able to submit a proposal, and we were awarded that proposal for 791344 Those funds will go to support existing staff, um, and again, those funds will be up for renewal um, for the consecutive years until 2027. Are there any questions? When you say the existing staff is supported, what staff members are specifically? We are uh, looking at this funding to support environmental health personnel specifically, especially given the need within that division. Also, environmental health falls within the foundational capabilities funding activities because it strengthens our capacity to work with our community partners. And so environmental health is a direct connect for these funds. Other questions? I I have a question. Um, I'm ignorant of what indirect percentage means. So could you explain that? Sure. So the indirect percentage, it is really a variable. It depends upon the funding source. So we have, um, we have a rate that uh, we have to abide by when we have any kind of funding that flows through the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. These funds actually come directly from uh, the federal government, and because of that, then we go with a set rate, which is the 10% de minimis rate. Typically, uh, that is a percentage that is set to cover administrative overhead that's related to the funding. Thank you. Any further questions? Council Donaldson. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. Um, Carolyn. In this synopsis on this uh, paper, it says number one um, of the three primary strategies, strategic partners partnerships with cross-sector organizations to assess and monitor the critical areas of need. Are, do we fund those cross-sector organizations? Are we giving them funding or are we just part, you know, coordinating with them? We are, for this year, for 2024, we are maintaining the work that we implemented in 2023. In 2023, we leveraged these funds to support those partnerships. For 2024, we're continuing to monitor that effort, and no funds will be uh, going to 
those community partners. That okay. was a subgrant recipient agreement um, that was encompassed within the 2023 year. And can you just name a few of the uh, the community partners that we're talking about here? Mm -hmm. Which organizations are those? There were 10, and um, I can also provide that list to you after, but some of those organizations include Centro de la Familia, um, also the Military Homefront Network. We have Hope Mountain Behavioral Health, also United Way, um, to capture some of those. Okay, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, might you add just a little bit of the strategy as it relates to funding those partners? So as a um, health yes. department, you all know that um, we, um, we're not the public health system, we're part of the public health system, and therefore strategic partnerships are critical to um, protecting the health of the community. And the, the basis in which we, um, for the first time, um, you know, since I've been with the agency in 20 plus years, we're able to um, provide these strategic partnership grants, which Dr. Tatiana um, Bailey, who is a PhD in, um, with an economist and, and PhD in, in public health, also is doing an evaluation to see um, what uh, the return on investment or, or how these um, funds are being used and, and what the results are. But the basis of um, providing these funds, it was a, a competitive process, open process through um, RFP. And then if you want to just to say a little bit about how that was grounded with our community health assessment within um, the top priorities in, in which our agency uh, has been working on. Yes, so as was mentioned, this was a competitive grant process. We received over 40 uh, applications and we will, were able to award 10. Each organization received 36,000. We reviewed the application based on the work being done uh, by that community partner within the areas of resource navigation mm -hmm. as well as behavioral health. And this was a direct connection to our community health assessment. Dr. Tatiana Bailey has been working with us and when we think about these 10 organizations, they have now formed a network, a cohort, and we've been working with them to develop essentially a study over the length of this grant period to ascertain how do we best partner with our community partners to leverage the collective impact, the funds, so that we're not really having redundant efforts within the community. And so what we've been able to do over the course of this time period has been able to lift up and out our best practices as well as get from our community partners how do we as public health best support with the work that they're doing within the community given that they have the direct connect with many of the residents who we are serving. I seeing no other questions I'm going to look for somebody to make a motion to accept this funding and I'll need a second. I move, move to approve. Sorry, go ahead. I'll move to approve. Okay, thank I, you. My second. And Doris with the second. All in favor of accepting this funding, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we're at the budget presentation. We're back. Back. Good morning. Um, is the slideshow? Sam, I'm going to ask you to talk into the microphone. Thank you. Sorry. Not a problem. Um, the, the presentation, please. Okay, um, so today I'm here to present the OAB, which will be optimally the original adopted budget for 2024. One thing I wanted to do first was kind of re, um, recap what we talked about last time. I know there was a lot of questions, so just wanted to make sure that we were all good with that. So um, what we proposed in the preliminary balanced budget was a reduction in revenue. A lot of that, majority of that was dedicated and 
was due to the COVID-19 grants. They are very restrictive, and as um, public health continues to respond and recover from COVID, they're going to be going away more and more. So that's a lot of what we're seeing. The other thing we're seeing on a reduction of the revenue is the loss of the state additional state LPHA funding. That is currently scheduled to end at the end of June. As right now, it's not currently scheduled to continue on, so we've taken the last six months of that out of this budget. Um, we don't wanna count on something that we just don't know is gonna happen or not. The other thing that I wanted to also point out is this, um, the revenue right here that we presented with the preliminary balance budget does not include any um, impact that the fee increases would have onto that budget. So that's where a lot of those reductions came. Again, mainly losing or the ending of those COVID-19 grants. Next slide. Um, so again, some of the, um, just a brief summary of some of the changes that from the 2023 to the preliminary balance budget. Um, again, we did add six additional FTE for environmental health services, something that they had desperately needed. That's a lot of what you're seeing in that increase for the per, for, on the personnel line. Um, the reduction of operating and capital, again, that's a lot of that, um, sorry, operating expenditures that were related to those COVID-19 grants and then the one-time expenditures within capital to do some work with the Public Health South building. <laughs> Next slide. So now we're gonna talk about changes from that preliminary balance budget that we discussed in October to what we're presenting today, which is the original adopted budget. Um, our revenue we are anticipating to, we're proposing to increase, and that is due to that increase in the fees. Um, that's where our, again, our increase in the revenue is coming from. We also are um, proposing a couple additional increases to um, expenditures, just a slight of $159,000. So total, that would come together. And while as originally we were proposing about a 1.2, almost $1.3 million into our fund balance, we, the change with the increase of the, um, sorry, the, the environmental health fee impacts, that has created a very positive impact. So with these changes, we are only proposing to go into fund balance by about $573,000. Um, a lot of that again, or sorry, that would take us to about 30% of our fund balance. And again, our policy is to be between 18 and 21%. So even approving this budget, we are still have that robust fund balance and we can um, support that. Next slide. So here is the actual numbers for the 2024 proposed adopted budget. Um, again, the fees did increase, so revenue went up about $800,000, and then slight increase in expenditures for a net change in fund balance of that 573,000 approximately. Next slide. So this is just a chart breaking apart the revenues um, and to the categories that we're receiving them. Again, a majority of them are program specific grants, those again come, we can only charge um, allowables with on those, and they're not very flexible for funding overall. Uh, next slide. And this one is just to break out again over all of the expenditures for public health. As you can see, over 75% of the proposed budget is personnel cost for, person or for public health. That is all I have for you guys today. Okay, any board members have any questions for Sam and the budget she just presented for 2024? Um, I guess I'll start maybe with the easier question. I just wanna make sure that I understand, um, let me see. The reduction in the LPHA does that actually come from the um, rescue plan that the state gets? And is that the one that's ending in, in um, July? So those are additional funds the state has provided based on the legislation. This last year, the state did opt to fund them with ARPA dollars. Um, the second year, they did not fund it with ARPA dollars, but this year they have. 
So okay. that's why we've combined them into one line because it's all coming from the state as part of their state LPHA funding dollars for us. Okay, when does ARPA end? <laughs> End with 2024, um, four. so. End of yes. Yep, end, end of the year. And I wanted to just provide a little bit more information related okay. to the um, state funding that we receive. And so on a um, steady status year, we receive about $923,000. That's not even a million dollars to support core public health services with a population of nearly 800 thousand people um, it's it's inadequate um, related to the to the demands and the services and and I wanted to to point that out because I am having conversations with our legislator Senator um, Paul Lindine um, representative Mark Snyder um, uh, representative Rose Proglisi and, and and I would just ask if board members have relationships with some of our legislators to um, I'd, I'd want to to get some support in reaching out because there was a, um, a meeting with the Joint Budget Committee last um, Monday, and um, we did have representatives um, supporting El Paso County and, and local, local funding, but $923,000 is the steady state. Um, when the pandemic happened, um, the state said that they were going to give us an additional $10 million statewide. So county's portion of that was, you know, almost about a, a, a million dollars more. They used ARPA for the first year, um, which is which is highly restrictive. Um, and then it was general fund. And now we're using ARPA funding for 2024 again. And so what what is in jeopardy here is the continuance um, of the state funding um, at um, the the minimum $12 million statewide on top of what the, the existing was. And so the proposal is, um, in the governor's budget currently, is $7.5 million is, is in the budget. Um, but at the JBC, they are considering um, maintaining that at $10 million and also potentially increasing it to $12 million. And I would say to continue um, meeting the demands and services, the increase in population growth, maintaining our staffing, um, which is, is critical to the work that we do. That, that is our most critical, critical asset is um, there, there are employees. And so um, that's what I'll be working with, the Colorado Association of Local Public Health Officials um, and our budget um, representatives and, and my leadership team as well to um, continue advocating for that funding because we need that. Um, El Paso County needs that funding to provide core public health services. You can see in the budget that the majority of our funds come from grants and contracts. Those are extremely restricted. Um, there's not a lot of flexibility. We're dealing with complex issues as it relates to behavioral health, homelessness. We've got care coordinators. We've got um, great innovative um, approaches, um, but the capacity is the concern there as well. And so more to come on that, but I did want to provide a little bit more information about how crucial that funding is to the ability of our agency maintaining staffing and good morale, as well as um, continuance of um, meeting the demands in, in the core public health services. Susan, can I, I want to clarify some of the things that you just said, because you went through these things pretty quickly, and I know you're you're working with them currently, and you're more familiar with them than I am, but you said currently in the governor's budget sits somewhere around $7 million. There's a proposal in legislature to up that to $10 million, and a second proposal to up that to $12 million. Mm -hmm. So we're, did I get those numbers correct? Correct. For the last... The last three years, it um, statewide uh, local public health agency has been um, receiving ten million dollars statewide. So, if it if the governor's budget stands as is, there would be a three million reduction statewide, and every agency would have to adjust accordingly. Um, but the legislature is look is working to either maintain it at ten million or possibly increase it by a couple of million. Yes, it's up to um, public health officials statewide to 
work with legislators to make the case for them to be um, supportive of maintaining the $10 million um, and potential $12 million statewide. And I will say also with, with the $10 million and, and $12 million, every agency is funded differently. Um, some of the um, counties have uh, city support. Um, for example, like the um, Pueblo Health Department is a city and county funded health department. There's so there, there's there's different um, ways that they're funded, but I will say that that's that's at a minimum of what local public health departments need, and especially El Paso County. So while that is is what is being proposed and and what we are advocating for, I do want to make the point that um, with inflation and the um, that the there hasn't been an increase. Um, I mean, it, it really puts us puts us back, and you know. You know, one aspect that I'm incredibly grateful for is um, our county commissioners, um, because when we have teen suicide uh, problems, they they fund um, staff to to work on that. Um, and and there are other issues that that we deal with where we we do get the support from our um, county commissioners and, and leadership, but all health departments do not have that. Um, and so that's why I'm saying that 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 public health statewide funding is so critical, not only to El Paso County, but but um, in the state of the state of Colorado throughout. And in addition, with the ARPA funds, the, you said it's highly restricted. But the thing to know about ARPA funds, and we're in the same boat, all the ARPA funds that individual towns and counties can use go to salaries. It's very specific what it can be used for. So if you can't fill out salaries or use that to raise morale, because ARPA funds are highly restricted, and you have to turn in significant paperwork of what you've used your ARPA funds. ARPA funds are um, due to end at the end of 2024. There is the possibility that there may be more funding, even though you've, you're, you're only counting on it through June 30th. Is that correct? Correct. There's a possibility, but it's not guaranteed at this point. Okay. Um, and I think that um, your information brought up another question, and that is, um, with state apportionment of uh, public health care dollars, um, is that decision generally based on population or is that decision generally based on um, the epidemiology of the issues that need to be addressed? That's a great question. So um, El Paso County fares well with the funding formula because it is population based. It is also based on the CDC in, um, vulnerability index. So there are different um, weights put, in, put, put into that funding formula for health disparities. Um, is, is it possible to calculate um, for El Paso County um, the clinical dollars projected to be saved per public health dollar spent? That has been a challenge. However, um, we are working with uh, Tatiana, uh, Dr. Tatiana Bailey on a, another project on a return on investment. And so we're hoping to um, demonstrate that, that to get to your question around, you know, what is the value, um, you know, on, on our services? In a, in a dollar uh, format. Okay, my second question, sorry that one went so long. Uh, my second question is much more concrete and that is uh, I wanna understand the capital expense. Um, so I see that in 2023, um, the projected budget was just over a million dollars, but so far by November, only about 339 thousand have been spent, 339,000. Um, and then for 2024, the capital expense is expected to be 395,000. So with that projected 1 million expenditure that did not materialize, is there, is there enough for the capital expenditures? I mean, what happened to the, that projection? So with the capital expenditures for this year, the project is still ongoing. And as we get those invoices in, they start to show up um, a lot. Of, they've had, unfortunately, some delays beyond oh, their control. Okay. COVID. COVID. 
And one yeah. of the things that I think it's hard for a layman to see when you're working on a town or a county budget, it's not like you balancing your checkbook. It doesn't work from 1-1 one, one to 12-31. Most budgets fiscally close out at the end of February, March. And so those numbers come in. And I think what you were asking is what happens to money left over? That's where the fund balance of that general fund comes in. There's a fund balance at the end of the year. It goes to specific projects. That's where overages go. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that there was sufficient um, funding for those capital expenditures if they weren't spent this year, if the need arose for it to be there for spending next year. But we're, you're anticipating 395,000 for next year. So yes, for next year we're expensing or anticipating about 395. Part of that is some carryover from the current construction project for Public Health South. And then there's a couple other smaller one-time expenditures, one-time projects that um, we've identified and need to get completed in 2024 as well. It's a great use of your fund balance because it is a one-time cost. So you're not setting yourself up to have to dive in year after year to fund these projects. So that's also. Okay. So. What I'm asking is that the original budget for 2023 was just over a million dollars, 339,000 was spent, and then the, the budget, the proposed budget, is just five thousand. So that's a little bit more than that. But your, but what? out half of that. So for the two years, that 700,000, is that needed or it's not needed? It is needed. What's happening is a lot of our projections are based off of historical spending. And so these capital projects are one-time adventures and we've not had a lot with Public Health South. So um, as those invoices come in, those expenditures will go up. And I do anticipate those expenditures to continue to go up for 2023. And then when you're talking about the fund balance, one interesting thing about a fund balance, at least for our town that we're very careful about doing is fund balances when you spend money out of a fund balance, you're required federally to keep a certain amount in, but a fund balance is usually only spent on a one-time cost. You don't wanna get into your fund balance to pad salaries or to do things going forward because they're typically one-time expenses. That the 700,000 that wasn't spent this year is going into the fund balance and that it's going to be spent next year coming out of that fund balance. So, um, I really appreciate the questions because you're laser sharp <laughs> like just with like, how, how is this adding up? Um, so we, we have had a lot of delays as it relates to some of the, the work being done at the Public Health South building to um, support the um, southeastern part of the county. And so what we do anticipate are some significant invoices that um, we're, we're pressing the, the contractor on to um, bring those forth hopefully um, later this week or early next week. And, and that, that has me nervous too. Too, but it, it, I, I get your, your, your question, but um, that, that should, um, those invoices should, should come in and then we'll, we'll be able to um, spend that out and, and, and get the work done. Yes. Okay. okay, and just in layman's terms, so when those invoices come in, we're going to be closer to the projections that Dr. Chan is reading for 2023. That's what I'm anticipating, Sam, and if you think otherwise, please speak up. Okay. And, yeah, and I, okay. I understand that, that because to me, the fund balance has always been when you're working on a budget, the fund balance has always been, how do you know how much to reserve in the fund balance? How do you know how much to transfer into reserves? And how do you know what is acceptable to spend of it in having those percentages? It's, it's a juggling act. Yeah. And we, we do anticipate spending all of the capital expenditure for 2023. Other questions? And welcome to Commissioner Bremer. Thank you for coming. Yes, Councilman Donaldson. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. President. And and uh, good morning. Thank you for the presentation. The six new environmental health staff positions, just, I think we've been told this before, but can you just remind us what those are in a little more detail, environmental health? Uh, so, so what, 
what that equals are um, environmental health inspectors and then um, administ uh, one administrative um, staff. And do I remember right that those are actually covered by the increase in the fees? The fees at some point will, will catch up and the fund balance is going to support us being able to recruit right at the first of the year. And then um, the fees should, uh, should catch up to um, cover those salaries um, where, where they can be covered. And I will just say too, while we're on topic of, of funding is that what we are going to be working on um, this coming year and in, in 2025 also is to get an increase in retail food establishment license fees because um, those are set in state statute and those are not covering covering the cost either. And not sure that we'll, we'll get to a place um, with um, the stakeholders and, and get the support to do 100% cost recovery, but those fees have not been updated um, for, a, for a very long time. And so that's, that's another area too that, um, is is a um, big focus in environmental health or the the restaurant brick and motors. So those six positions are kind of balanced. We expect maybe by the end of twenty four are balanced out by the fees, but we have, we're about at half a million dollars uh, spending more than we're taking in in uh, twenty four in our budget, um, which will be covered from the fund balance. What do we expect in 25? I mean, do we, are you looking at that? Do we say, okay, and we shouldn't have to dip into it again in 25 for this reason? Or do we think, nope, it's gonna get even a little deeper in 25? So um, just to kind of quickly go back to the question about the fund balance that we're dipping into, a lot of that is those one-time construction projects cost, yeah. about almost 400,000 of it. So that's a good majority of that. Um, looking forward, we are strategically planning and looking at what grants we have, where we can maximize our funding, um, what we can advocacy we can do along the state and local. So we are looking at it and working on future projections. And I also say, um, Mr. Donaldson, that you know as we've been no, working uh, to reduce our funding as it relates to COVID. Um, and, you know, there was pre-COVID and then COVID, and now we're right-sizing um, our agency for the future. And so when there are positions that are open, I'm sorry, when there are um, people resign or people retire, we do look at those positions to determine, um, do we need that position? Um, does that need to be filled? Is there something else within our agency as we're looking uh, towards the future? So that's going to be part of the process um, in, in 2024 to really figure out what does 2025 and, and beyond look for. And we can't count on it, but um, I am very hopeful about the state per capita um, funding, um, us being funded um, th through that, which, which is not in the budget. And then um, we'll be able to um, support um, staffing as well for 2025. And I just like um, <laughs> um, Mayor Havanar's um, comment about juggling. I mean, I, I feel like it's a constant balance and a constant chasing and a constant, um, it's a constant effort um, for, for our agency. It's scary. It's, yeah, it's, it, it, it never lets up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments from health, Board of Health members? All right, we will be looking for a motion and a second to approve this 2024 budget as it's been presented to us. Have I'll make motion. a motion to approve the budget. Thank you, Mayor Havanyar, a second. And thank you, Dr. Chan, for the second. All in favor of accepting this budget as presented for 2024, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? No, carries unanimously. And I believe now, Lori, we have a resolution to read. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Give me just a minute, please. Sorry about that. Mr. President, this is Commissioner Bremer. Um, and just a quick disclaimer, I did vote aye on that, and I had 
been able to review all of the documentation ahead of time, even though I was not here for the full presentation. Thanks. Thank you. All right, thank you. So uh, we do have a resolution to adopt and appropriate the 2024 El Paso County Public Health Budget. Whereas pursuant to sections 25.1.508 and 5.11 and section 29.1.103 CRS, the El Paso County Board of Health or Board of Health has the power and duty to adopt a budget for El Paso County Public Health or Public Health for fiscal year 2024. And whereas Public Health has recommended that the Board of Health adopt a budget for fiscal year 2024 as indicated in attachments A and B hereto and incorporated herein by reference. And whereas the Board of Health has conducted a public meeting to consider adoption of the 2024 budget and has received and considered public input regarding said proposal. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the El Paso County Board of Health that the Board of Health hereby adopts the fiscal year 2024 El Paso County Public Health Budget as indicated on attachments A and B, which is incorporated herein by reference, that the fiscal year 2024 El Paso County Public Health Budget may be amended from time to time by appropriate action of the Board of Health. Moved, seconded, and adopted by the El Paso County Board of Health at its regular meeting held on December 13th, 2023, El Paso County Board of Health. Okay, and I got things out of order. After reading the uh, resolution, now we need a motion and a second and a vote. So, um, okay, thank you. Dr. Tan makes the motion. Do we have a second? Second. And thank you, uh, Ms. Ralston, for the second. All in favor of accepting the budget and resolution as read, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And then I've been asked to read the names into the record. Um, passed unanimously, we have Commissioner Lujinos Gonzalez, Commissioner Cami Bremer, Councilman Dave Donaldson, our Vice President Doris Ralston, myself as President Ted Colas, Mayor Glant Havanyar, and uh, Dr. Chan. And we have two members that are absent and were unable to vote. Okay, we're moving on to another resolution now, uh, Lori. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so item 7A is the 2024 Sunshine Resolution. I'll read it into the record. Resolution of the El Paso County Board of Health, whereas the El Paso County Board of Health hereafter Board of Health is a local public body subject to certain requirements of section 246402 CRS relating to public meetings, and whereas the Board of Health is required by said statute to designate at its first regular meeting of each year a place or places within the boundaries of the local public body for posting of public notices of its meetings, and whereas House Bill 19-1087 went into effect on August 2nd, 2019, and allows local governments to satisfy meeting notice requirements by posting on the local government's website. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the El Paso County Board of Health that the official place for posting public notices of El Paso County Board of Health meetings and other public notices for the year 2024 shall be on the El Paso County webpage under upcoming meetings and link is provided in the resolution and the El Paso County Public Health webpage under Board of Health meeting schedule. And again, the link is in the resolution. Public notices may also be posted on the internet and other locations as determined appropriate by the Board of Health or its secretary. The Secretary of the Board of Health shall be the official custodian of the minutes of the Board of Health's public meetings requiring such minutes. The Office of the Secretary of the Board of Health is located at the Citizen Service Center, 1675 West Garden of the Gods Road, Suite 2044, Colorado Springs, Colorado, 80907. Moved, seconded, and adopted by the El Paso County Board of Health at its regular meeting held December 13th, 2023. Okay, we need a motion and a second and vote on that resolution. I'll move approval. Second. Okay, and I didn't see who made the motion. Is that? Commissioner Bremer. Thank you, Commissioner Bremer. And second by Mayor Havener. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and passes unanimously. And again, names for the record are, I'm gonna go the other direction now. We got Mayor Havener. Um, Dr. Deborah Chan, myself, Ted Colas, our Vice President Doris Ralston, uh, Councilman Donaldson, Commissioner Bremer, and Commissioner Lojinos Lo Gonzalez. And now a second resolution for the 
uh, meeting schedule. Item 7B is a resolution for the Board of Health 2024 regular meeting schedule. Whereas pursuant to 25-1-508-4B1-CRS, the El Paso County Board of Health, hereafter Board of Health, is required to meet in regular session at least every three months as may be established by resolution of the Board of Health. And whereas the Board of Health desires to establish its regular meeting schedule for calendar year 2024. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the El Paso County Board of Health that the El Paso County Board of Health shall conduct regular meetings during calendar year 2024 as follows. Uh, the dates are set forth in the resolution. Number two, meeting dates, times, and locations are subject to change or cancellation due to incl inclement weather or operational considerations. Three, special meetings of the Board of Health will be scheduled as necessary. Four, all regular meetings will be held at the Citizens Service Center, 1675 Garden of the Gods Road, Colorado Springs, Colorado, unless otherwise announced. All Board of Health work sessions, public hearings, regular meetings, and special meetings are open to the public. Moved, seconded, and adopted by the El Paso County Board of Health at its regular meeting held on December 13th, 2023. Okay, and to accept the meeting schedule, I need a motion and a second. Lojinos moved to approve. Second, uh, Councilman Donaldson. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Gonzalez and Councilman Donaldson. All in favor of accepting this uh, schedule, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And again, reading through the list, we have Commissioner Gonzalez, Commissioner Bremer, Councilman Donaldson, Vice President Ralston, myself, Ted Colas, uh, Dr. Deborah Chan, and <coughs> Mayor Havanier. Moving on to new business, and thank you, board members, for uh, getting through that busyness. Now we're getting on to new business. And the first order in new business is the election of uh, board officers. And I would like to open it up and see if there are any nominations for the, uh, for the office of president, vice president, and our public health director will continue to uh, fill the position of secretary, uh, but are there any any discussion or um, any anyone who is interested in any of those positions? None, okay. Um, Doris and I have had an opportunity to talk about this at our uh, monthly meeting to see if we, you know, are we, um, willing to go on in our positions, and we both have uh, expressed a, um, an interest in going on if there is no opposition, and if nobody else wants to uh, put their name in for those positions, um, certainly welcome to. We don't have a lock on them. These are uh, voted on annually, so anyone, has, anyone who sits on our board has an opportunity for that, as uh, all, all of the board members present, as well as those who aren't here, uh, General Briggs and Dr. Vu, so again, open it up and see if there's any discussion about anyone who would like to fill those positions, uh, put their name in. Doing so well. And <laughs> hearing none, um, then I guess I would move forward by saying, um, I would be happy to fill the position of president for the upcoming year of 2024. And Doris, would you fill the position of vice president for 2024? Yes. Okay, now that any discussion on that, uh, and if not, then we can. Do we need a formal motion? We do need a motion and a second. Uh, President Colas, I um, make a motion that uh, you and Vice President Doris Ralston be um, appointed, elected, nominated <laughs> um, as board chair for 2024. I'll second that. And thank you, Mayor Havanier, for the second. All in favor of those board positions, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. We'll be happy to serve in that capacity in the upcoming year. And Susan, it is a pleasure to work with you and your staff. We appreciate the opportunity. And now I see that we have a approval of a um, 
sublease agreement for the Citizen Service Center. Their presentation on this, Susan. I didn't know if I mean this is this is part of the the county's sublease agreement. If um, there are any questions, I'll I'll take them. But I you know maybe Sam um, will as well. Essentially, I mean it's it's um, our agency's. Um, lease agreement with with the county and, and being in CSC and all of the um, things that go into that the common area maintenance the utilities the IT support the um, so it's it's all in there you'll see a, a budget sheet and um, that's essentially what what it is are there any major changes that you're aware of from previous years none that I am aware of uh, mr. chair yes I just wanted to add that the, this is the standard uh, the uh, standard lease that the county uh, utilizes for all the other departments that utilize space on a per square footage uh, and and similar. So this would be in line with every other department uh, that ha that utilizes space <laughs> uh, in the county. Understood. Uh, just a, an annual technicality that we have to go through. Um, so I'll need a motion to. Uh, Accept that lease agreement. Uh, we all have copies of it. Um, uh, I'll need a motion and a second. So move, Councilman Donaldson. Thank you. And a second. Second. Okay. I uh, will give that one to Doris. Another tie. All in favor of accepting the the uh, 2024 lease agreement for the Citizen Service Center sublease. Let it be known by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? None, and that takes us to the director's report. Mr. Pressure Chair, off me. Yes. I apologize if I missed this, but did the board um, appoint the public health director as the uh, secretary to the board as part of 8A? Uh, yes, affirmative. Thank you. Okay, with, with my report, um, it is respiratory uh, illness season, and so we have a presentation on um, what the respiratory season looks like for El Paso County. And it looks like we've got Marini Claber coming up, who is our um, program, let's see. Assistant. Introduce yourself. She's been with our agency forever. She recently got promoted in the last, what, how many months to the CDC uh, officially uh, deputy <laughs> so program I'm, manager. I'm officially the assistant program manager for the communicable disease program at this point in time. Thank you. And I have been with the agency almost 19 years. Um, so good morning and Merry Christmas. Um, so just a little background on respiratory season. It's an annual event. Um, it starts, we start tracking it about the beginning of October and it runs through the end of May every year. And um, now that we're a little over two months into it, we thought we'd give you a little update. Next slide, please. So in the state of Colorado last season, um, and then up to, to where we are this season, um, you can see that this season COVID has started to um, slow down a little bit. Um, the first line that comes down tells you where we started this season's tracking. Um, and then that second line that comes down tells you a little bit about where we are and then understanding that um, some reporting is a little bit delayed because these things don't have to be reported on the day that they're um, identified. So at this point in time, um, flu and RSV are tracking up. And just so you know, if you're comparing last year to this year in that graph, um, this is the first season for which RSV hospitalizations are tracked statewide. Previously, that was done just for the Denver metro area. Next slide, please. So specifically in El Paso County related to influenza, um, we have um, had 92 cases of hospitalized flu reported this year, and um, we are seeing an increase in those at this point in time with the largest burden of 
disease being people over the age of 65 and those under the age of five, which is typically what we would anticipate seeing. Um, this actually graph actually represents the last five years of seasons. Um, again, that starts in October going to May, and that's why that's tracked that way. It's not um, necessarily at January to December, which would be so much nicer. Um, but as you can see, um, pre-pandemic, we had a, uh, which is the green line, we had a peak in February, and, um, and then it came down in March as the pandemic ramped up. That was an unprecedented drop in cases in flu that year. And then um, in our pandemic season, for which COVID was the end all be all, we really didn't see a lot of influenza. Um, and then last year, our first season post pandemic, we saw an early peak, still don't know why, um, but we maybe Bernadette can speak to that in a moment, but we did see an early peak last year. And then this year we um, have started to see a peak and it's come down a little bit, but I think it's a little too early to tell at this point in time. And the, the current season is in the pink at the bottom. Next slide, please. So again, with influenza in the state of Colorado, um, as we would anticipate seeing, we see uh, influenza A that emerges first. Um, this year we're seeing the predominance of H1N1 influenza, which was the 2009 pandemic. Um, and then also a little bit of H3N2. Um, we typically see influenza B peak a little bit later in the season in winter and spring. Um, and then so far, um, although it is a little bit early, but CDC does track throughout the season, whether or not they anticipate that the flu vaccine is a good match for the circulating viruses in any given year. And so far, uh, CDC is indicating that the, it is a good match, so that's nice. So we should see hopefully people who got vaccinated having fewer bad outcomes. All right, next slide, please. So this talks about El Paso County specifically with respect to all three pathogens um, this season so far. The 40 on the bottom represents that first week of October and 52, uh, which this does not go to quite yet, is the last week of the year. And so that's what that's tracking. Um, you can see influenza in blue, and these are all hospitalized cases of disease. So COVID, is steadily up there high, but has started to drop off. Whereas, as you can see, that influenza and RSV have started to rise. And for RSV specifically, um, the majority of these cases that are being hospitalized are under the age of four, which is not uncommon for RSV. We would typically see RSV in the, the young pediatric population, and then a little bit um, in the other end of the spectrum as well. And then, um, thankfully, our COVID hospitalizations have started to plateau since those other two hospitalizations for RSV or influenza have started to increase. Next slide, please. So back to the whole statewide picture um, with respect to RSV specifically. Um, for the week ending in December 2nd, we had 471 hospitalizations statewide, um, again, with those predominantly being in pediatric patients, 83%, and then 17% being in individuals that are older typically. But in this case, it's all adults. Next slide, please. So if we don't wanna get sick, we should stay home. Um, we should avoid close contact with people who are sick. Always practicing good <clears throat> respiratory hygiene, coughing into your sleeve washing your hands with soap and water often, um, or if that's not available, making sure to use your alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I remember someone talking about keeping your hands below your waist to, to, to avoid that. Um, I have to think about that often. And know your own personal health risk. You know, how likely are you? Do you have any underlying conditions that would lead you to become sick um, and so understanding that in order to determine like if you are a family member high risk, what should you be doing um, to ensure that you're not getting sick and that you're not sharing that because in this case, sharing is not caring. And your last choice is to get vaccinated if you so choose. 
And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Albanese to talk about vaccine. Questions? Hi, good, good morning. morning. Can, uh, can you hear, all hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> A little loud. Okay, and very good. I think we have one question real quick. Um, oh, okay, very good. How much has the population of El Paso County increased over the last year? Oh, that's like a, a demographic question. I see. Well, the, I think we're we're in the low 700s now. Um, well, let's see. Probably by the end of the presentation, I can look that up real quick. But I don't. Okay. I don't have last. I don't have last year's numbers. I mean, it, it, it's it not. It, it didn't. It didn't increase by a hundred thousand. Let's put it that way. So. There is probably, you know, a, a lot, you know. Dr. Albanese, increase. Dr. Yeah. Albanese, um, we'll look that up. Um, you know, the, it was 757,000 um, last year, but we'll look that up. Are there any other questions for Maroney before we move on to Dr. Albanese and she's going to be speaking about vaccine? Well, <laughs> some of this information is presented as rates and some of it is presented as cases. And uh, I'm just trying to understand, um, was there actually a change in the rate of infection and hospitalized cases? So, so remember, Dr. Jen, early, early in the season, I mean, we're, we're just eight weeks. You know, we, we, these counts just, just from the tradition of how we do surveillance, we track hospitalized cases. Uh, we've done that influenza for uh, a number of years that was um, well-established. Uh, during a pandemic, for the for the need to be able to monitor um, the the most ill uh, from COVID, and then for RSV, this is the first season statewide that RSV hospitalizations are being reported. So so we have different um, baselines compared to the other other pathogens, uh, flu having the most history, and the pandemic was what it was, and now, and now we have statewide RSV surveillance. Calculating rates is really something that, that if we're thinking about during the, the season, there are reports of the count of hospitalizations done uh, each week that are activated each week um, from October 1st uh, through in, into May. Um, and so calculating rate, so adjusting it for the population is a little warm because if you calculate it on October 7th, that's a different cumulative experience, right? One week of, of cumulative experience versus calculating it uh, retrospectively for the end of the season when we have all of the all of the hospitalization experience uh, with the winter viruses done, right? And then you calculate it. It's a little bit, a little bit uh, wonky when you're trying to interpret rates early on uh, as, the, as the season is just beginning to, to grow. And so that's why Yes. Okay. So the the rates that are reported from last year, from 20, 2022, those were calculated in retrospect, say, for October 1st, 2022, that information came in and then was calculated, say, you know, some, something like in December. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I've got a question, Dr. Albanese. Um, this year is the first year that the state is um, looking at RSV uh, has been presented. And also this is the first year that there's been a RSV 
vaccine available for elderly population, will those numbers be separated out for the elderly population that has the opportunity to get the vaccine to see how effective that vaccine is over time? Thank you. I'll let you know when it comes up.
really for, for you as an individual to choose to get that kind of education, which is something that we strongly encourage, uh, and you all all recommended that change, particularly for the literature about the future of my season. And it's one of the best things that you have to do to protect yourself from getting infected with protection. Um, we're getting to know this and we don't particularly uh, in the outcomes of which we should be for a medical condition um, and, and then uh, our older population and then, uh, uh, you know, for children who are really uh, particularly under five years of age and get a little bit harder to hit harder. But if those numbers stay low, we're not getting the benefit of uh, population immunity, right? community immunity, the protection that virus uh, is spreading a lot through the population. So I just want to point out um, that at this point in the season, we still have several months uh, to go. Uh, at this point in the season, um, you know, you know that, uh, the population benefit of vaccination is going to be not ideal uh, until we see these numbers that are starting to climb out a little bit more. Okay, okay next slide, please. Many of you may have seen uh, the news about uh, cases of pneumonia in children going way up in different parts of the country, in different parts of the world, you know, what's, what's, what's going on. And so, so we received a good update from uh, Colorado Department of Health and Environment, the EPAG, um, last week to sort of summarize a little bit more if I want to move that information forward. Uh, so, so uh, reports uh, around the country and below us about locations around the world, depending on who's reporting, about the frequency of pediatric pneumonia. But when you look a little more carefully at it, the cause of pneumonia is really a variable. I mean, viral infections can give pneumonia in kids, and certain bacterial infections can cause pneumonia in kids. And so I think when you look more carefully at these reports, it's not just, you know, everything we worry about is always going to have to be and the SARS CoV 2. We don't, we don't want that to happen. But when you get temperatures uh, uh, in the public health world, uh, uh, it's pretty high, high in terms of the long term, long term impact. So the, the change in, in, uh, in sort of the, 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 the clinical disease, right? I have pneumonia. And we want to be very sensitive to that and attentive to that and try to figure out what's going on. So as it ends up, these are, these are not cases of pneumonia that are due to one single um, infectious agent. Um, but in fact, due to, due to multiple uh, different types, and, and, and it's, it's, we are still coming out of the of the pandemic, and so they have this term post-pandemic immunity that we're looking at that the term that the EPAG used and um, uh, other public health agencies are using. But what that what that means is, you know, during a pandemic, we have people, you know, to, to sort of get us through uh, that uh, hundred year event. Um, you know, that we were asking people to stay home and to wear a mask yeah. and to stay away from other people when you're sick and so forth. And so we oh, had a period of time where there wasn't, we tried to, uh, to do our best to reduce exposure to COVID-19, but it also reduced exposure to other infectious agents, including, you know, flu and RSV uh, and even uh, certain bacterial infections. And so we're still coming out of that. And so, you know, we, we have folks that, that you know, uh, groups of people who, who didn't get the usual number of infections that you would, number of flu that you would get during the pandemic or number of RSV cases, um, uh, and during that, that didn't happen because we were using the uh, um, medical uh, procedures to, to try to keep people safe from COVID, which, which kept people safe from the other um, uh, infectious agents as well. Uh, so now that we're getting back to normal and normal behaviors and people are traveling uh, and so on and so forth, I mean, I think for the most part, uh, our, our, our physical interactions are, are back to pretty pretty close to, to what they were pre pandemic. That we're seeing a higher rate of infections, kind of as a rebound, and and so that's probably what uh, what happened last season with with RSV, for example, may be still a little bit left over um, into season, and then eventually um, come back sort of back to a to, to a sort of normal normal level. No magic magic number on when that may happen. Um, but we're probably uh, probably getting there. So another cause of pediatric pneumonia is called mycoplasma. Um, has been also observed uh, in certain parts around the United States and then a little bit China 
uh, had in Europe. And so uh, CDC, AG, and CDC have been looking about uh, looking at this uh, aggressively in the United States and of course, in, in Colorado to see uh, what's been going on here. And, and in fact, even in Colorado, we have not um, seen an unusual rise in the number of travel marijuana, you know, like bacterial infection that can cause uh, pneumonia in kids, and we, we haven't really seen that uh, in Colorado as of yet this, this winter season. Next slide, please. Thank you. So again, this 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 uh, summarizes the CDC AG uh, reported uh, from China clusters of pneumonia identified in children, some due to mycotoxin, which is a bacterial infection, some due to RSV, some due to flu, adenovirus is another common winter respiratory virus. So again, there isn't a new uh, germ, there isn't a single germ explaining this. Uh, it's just a sort of an accumulation of more respiratory illness. Um, uh, this season in certain in certain geographic locations with with uh, applied to um, germs that wouldn't be recognized. Again, I think in, uh, in Denmark, uh, an increase in mycoplasma, um, uh, but again, um, uh, maybe just sort of a, a fall off from, from the pandemic that we don't normalize. Um, uh, reports from from Ohio, uh, but again, nothing 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 unusual. Um, and the CDC, uh, I think this was from about a week ago, saying that we're not that we're not really seeing anything particularly uh, unusual in terms of what's causing the disease. It's just that it's a little bit more than some of the other features coming out of the pandemic. Uh, so this is some data that uh, from Children's Women's Hospital Colorado. So they're they're a, you know they're a gigantic uh, donor of children in our state. Uh, thankfully, they're a fantastic uh, hospital and uh, great uh, healthcare providers there. So they've been working closely with CDC AG on this mycoplasma issue. So this is a, this is a slide that they uh, allowed allowed me to share today. Um, showing uh, uh, data from uh, many years. Uh, so on the left side of the slide, it's from 2014, all the way down uh, uh, to November of 2023. And so this, they, they test for mycoplasma, right? Their laboratory has a, has a good way to test mycoplasma infections in kids who present with pneumonia or other uh, more severe respiratory illness. And so you can just see the, the trend. So you can see in blue bars um, go up, which is the, uh, the most common mycoplasma test, or the orange bar, or the orange line is the percent positive of normal tests being done for mycoplasma, what percent are positive. So a higher orange bar means more mycoplasma detected, higher orange line means more mycoplasma detected, lower one means not so much. So you can see that that it just goes up and down, right? This is this is a mycoplasma, this is a seasonal bacterial infection in children and adults, and it kind of goes up and down, up and down, up and down, depending on the time of the season. And then if you look towards the right side of the uh, slide, it seems to become flat. That's the pandemic. <laughs> That's uh, what happens when people stay away from each other and they don't pass infections from from one person to the next or one child to the next. Result to child, result to child, result, you go in all directions. But when uh, you know, when we institute uh, precautions to prevent spread of respiratory illness, it, it works. Um, and so we sort of had a, a flat line during the pandemic. And then that little dip all the way to the right side of the slide um, shows a little bit of detection, uh, you know, bouncing back okay. of, of mycoplasma in children um, this current respiratory season, so, so this fall. So there's nothing unusual about it. It's not at this point in time and from the, what the data we have now in until uh, in December, we're not seeing anything uh, flip back up wildly uh, compared to, you know, many, many years back, so on and so forth. So I just wanted to share the slide that, that we are monitoring this, you know, pediatric pneumonia situation in, in Colorado uh, through CDC AG and some nice data from children's um, indicating that, uh, that at least for us in, in Colorado, uh, from um, using some, some good data from children's, that there doesn't appear to be anything unusual with mycoplasma infection in children. So I think that is my last slide. So I will pause there and see if there are any questions. So now I have my question. Board members. I have a question for you, Dr. Albanese. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, just want to confirm, currently there's no pediatric vaccine for RSV. Is that right? So there is a different product to prevent children from two different products. Children from getting RSV, which is either cold or new approach. So, uh, one of the approaches is 
uh, one of the RSV vaccines being used in persons 60 and older had um, been evaluated for use in pregnant women to protect newborns from RSV. So I'm not, I'm not going to, how, how does that work? So if you um, vaccinate a pregnant woman, um, that person is going to develop an antibody response, an, an antibody response because they have received the vaccine. So it's actually a benefit to themselves. But what happens uh, if that vaccine is used, particularly in the last uh, trimester of pregnancy, those antibodies that are produced in, the, in, in, in that person will get transferred through from the mother, get transferred through the placenta to the baby. And then once baby is born, they have antibody on board. And so um, this, this, the, these clinical studies were designed that if we can vaccinate um, the mom later in pregnancy, give time for those antibodies to cross the placenta to, to then be picked up by, by the baby, once baby is born, they, they come out with antibody on board. So in fact, the, the, the clinical studies demonstrated upwards of 60, 70 plus percent protection of the baby for the first six months of life because they picked up mom's antibodies by being when, when, uh, when mom was vaccinated up towards the end of, of pregnancy. So that's the first approach. And again, that's a new approach um, for this season. The second approach for young children is uh, manufacturers have created not a vaccine for young children. They've been trying to do that for RSV in young kids for a long time. It's just it's a tricky, very tricky virus and a little hard to generate a good immune response in young babies getting vaccinated. So that so that approach has not worked out. But what? But instead, um, just like remember COVID, there was there was a product called monoclonal antibody, the COVID antibody product that that we used. Um, certain individuals at very, very high risk of getting severe, severe COVID. So in essence, the manufacturers have created an antibody product for babies. And so rather than this being a vaccine where you, you know, get injected with the vaccine and your body creates this immune response, this is, this is an antibody product that is created, you know, in, 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 in with pharmaceutical companies in their laboratories and then given to young babies as the antibody. And then young, 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 those young babies will carry that antibody through the RSV season, approximately October uh, to the spring, and then be protected. And again, that product in, clin in several clin large clinical trials internationally also was very effective, upwards of, of 80 plus percent effective in preventing severe RSV disease and hospitalizations in young babies. So we have that product available for infants a from birth on up to eight months of age. That's the most common age group. Uh, for that product to be provided. And so instead of a baby getting a shot of vaccine, they would get a shot of this antibody product to be protected during their first uh, RSV season. So it's a little bit, the, the, the recommendations are a, a little bit complex because it's, again, just trying to protect very young infants who are the ones that get hit by RSV the hardest, make up the far majority of hospitalizations RSV related pneumonia deaths in that young age group. So, so the very young babies get hit with RSV the hardest. And so this antibody product is intended to protect, again, primarily that window of um, from birth to, to eight months of age. The, the, the challenge with that product, again, brand new, this is the first respiratory season being using it. There's a high demand uh, for it, but the, but the manufacturer um, Maybe got, you know, just was a little off the mark in terms of kind of estimating how much product they would be request for throughout the throughout the country. So the demand has been high and the supply has not been able to meet the demand. So so there's been uh, a bit of a challenge um, with having enough supply coming uh, from the manu manufacturer. So it's a little bit harder to find that that product in in uh, pediatricians offices, including uh, our immunization clinic here at the at the health department. So again, we're going to kind of get through this this season uh, a little, you know, not not quite being able to offer as much product as we as we'll hopefully be for for next season. But but in fact, um, so getting back to your original question, so there's two ways of trying to protect young children, either through vaccinations of moms uh, at the end of pregnancy uh, during the respiratory virus season, during the RSV season, and then also through this antibody product, both of which we expect to be available for next season as well. That was a long answer to your question, but I thought I'd that. Thank you, Dr. Albanese.
Board members, any other questions for Dr. Albanese? I do have a question. Um, <coughs> in regards to older adults, why aren't they already protected from prior exposure to RSV? Because that, that, that virus likes to change. It likes to change. And so, so most, most pre-pandemic, right, normal activities, gravel, everything else, caregivers of babies, and then toddlers. In, in, in normal years, nearly all children, every single child less than two years of age gets 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 RSV by the time they're two. It, it's it's essentially a universal experience, and so the majority of RSV disease really is is in young young children. And so, but then you try to carry that all the way out, you know, 50 years later, um, to to when you're 60 and older. Uh, so a few things happen. One is you don't get exposed as much. Um, uh, to the the severity of illness in in you know adolescents and young adults and middle aged adults is is a cold. So for most uh, most adults, RSV the the, man, the the symptoms of RSV infection are going to be uh, a cold. And then when you get into 60 and older, your immune function starts to wear down a little bit, right? Uh, kind of going up in years and and things just that your immune response is not as robust. And of course that that continues as the old, the older that you get. Uh, into that senior population, your your overall immune system just gets a little a little a little less strong than than it was um, before, and so you know depending on each individual's so it, it's not it's not as universal that everybody by the age of two years of age gets RSV infection. We've all had it. It's gone. It's not that way in older adults. So I think you know what one person's exposure to RSV is not going to be the same as others, and then their immune response to it is a it's a little bit weaker. So when you look at the, the surveillance data for RSV hospitalizations, when you know in, in locations where we've been doing this for a while, it's V-shaped in the sense that uh, high incidence, high amount of disease in the very young children, then it goes down, and then the, the other half of the U comes back up in older adults. In, and um, you know they used a, a cutoff of 60 plus um, uh, for vac for the vaccine approval. But it's really intended to be persons 60 years and older who have chronic health conditions that put them at risk to develop severe RSV disease. So it's not everyone over 60 years of age um, who's at risk to, to really suffer or have a bad time with an RSV infection. It's really person with, uh, with underlying conditions. And the more severe those underlying conditions, including other conditions that weaken, weaken your immune system, not just age, then they're, they're the ones recommended to get vaccine. So it's a very much more variable um, experience, but as a whole, in the in the uh, senior population, um, you're going to see higher rates of RSV go up um, with age. So it's not so much that you know whether it's I don't have memory from I immunologic memory from a few years ago when I had bar RSV infection versus versus it's an older adult who just uh, um, doesn't have a, as robust an immune response um, uh, to these viral infections and. Uh, the virus concerns a little bit uh, as well. So I, I think it's more just an immune response issue um, by with age rather than I had, you know, RSV when I was 40 and I'm now 75 and how come it didn't protect me? I just, I just think that immune response over time is just not as good. Thank you, Dr. Albanese. And Susan, any other uh, information with your director's report? No, I don't have um, anything else, but I'd like to wish everyone a, uh, a Merry Christmas, and I know you're going to provide a reminder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I want to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, too, uh, to Susan and your leadership team, but then to every single public health employee, uh, from the most recently hired all the way through the most senior employee, regardless of job responsibility, day in and day out, they're working for our community to keep us safe and healthy, and we are grateful to every single one of them. Thank you for all of the work that every one of you do. We, it is greatly appreciated by our community and by this board. For my board members, uh, fellow board members, thank you for all that you do for our community. Some of you have very heavy responsibilities and uh, you carry those well, and then you volunteer for this board, and you do that because you care about the community. I hope that you all have a very blessed Christmas season as well. And I would like to invite or remind board members that there is a 
holiday luncheon going on uh, following this meeting, 1.30 to, I'm sorry, 11.30 to 1.30 at the Citizen Service Center that everybody is welcome to attend. I know that Susan and the staff would like to uh, see as many of us as possible there. So if you can make it, um, we'd certainly love to see you there. And with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, one other point of clarification, and this is for you, Lori. Um, Cammie, uh, Commissioner Bremer, when she made her um, motion to accept myself and Doris as president and vice president, it didn't formally include secretary and Susan as secretary. I thought that was default, uh, but if you need us to re-vote, we are well, happy to do that. Yes, I would appreciate a, an action to, okay. to, take, to do that. So okay. would you amend the... With, with that, um, for clarification, um, I would like to make a motion that Ted Colas be our president for next year, for 2024, Doris Rouston be our vice president, and the um, secretary of the Board of Health be um, the executive director or appointee. And we need a second? Can we get a second? second. And thank you, Mayor Havenier, for the second. All in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And it passed unanimously. And now I am looking for a motion to adjourn. And thank you, Dr. Chan. Motion to adjourn. A second. And thank you, Mayor Havenier. All in favor of adjournment, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. And see you all next year. Thank you. Next year. Hey. My first name is. That one I can get. I'm going over to your office. He's all right. Am I the only one? Dave. Two weeks of crazy Wednesdays and then. Yeah, let me know if you want to. Sales tax over Congratulations.